chapter number eight, and I uh, want to thank some guests and returning guests for joining us this morning, this Sunday morning, and I uh, hope to be a blessing to you uh, and by way of the services. Uh, so Luke chapter number eight, verses number 22 through 25, not a very lengthy portion of scripture, but I think that there's some truth in here that can be applied to each and every one of our lives. So if you're if you're there and if you are physically able, we ask you to please stand out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word here this morning. And we're going to read Luke chapter number 8, verse 22 through 25. The Bible says this. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. <laughs> That's our Savior. That's your Savior. The winds and the waters, even they obey him. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get right on into the message here. Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, just this... This powerful passage already, Lord, just reading it, it just, uh, dear God, I hope it brings to the forefront of our minds how wonderful your son Jesus is. And Lord, I just ask you that you would please just help me to preach, help me, Lord, to uh, remember the, the study and to remember, dear God, uh, the, the message that you brought to my heart and, Lord, that it would be conveyed to your people so that the flock would be spiritually fed today. And, uh, Lord, I ask you that your will and way would be done. Lord, I pray that you would just move amongst us. And, Lord, that we can't help. And there's no denying, there's no denying that you spoke through the word this morning. So, Lord, I pray you please be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. How many of you enjoy flying? How many of you hate flying? About half of you, half of the people there. Some of you just kind of little flick the wrist just a little bit, just to put a little emphasis on your hatred for flying. Uh, but I remember when I was in Bible college and uh, coming home for, I don't remember what exactly, maybe a holiday, Thanksgiving, I'm not exactly too sure. Uh, but uh, actually we were, yeah, coming home, and uh, we were on, if those of you who've been flying before, flew at a DIA, uh, I was boarding group C. You know what boarding group C is? Boarding group C is basically you are the last of the last to get on your flight. And basically it was a full flight and there's no room. There's, there, everyone's crammed in there like sardines basically. And so I remember looking for a, fl uh, looking for a seat, and, and, and I, as I was making my way, like all the seats were taken, and, except for towards the back there. And, and, and where I was sitting, I mean, I got the aisle seat, because no one likes to take the aisle seat. Uh, so I got the aisle seat, and there was two people already sitting to my right, and the, the middle seat, and then the, the, the window seat there. And as we're taking off, the flight seems to be going fine. The flight seems to be going as normal. But then, for those of you who hate flying, uh, it's a real blessing when you experience turbulence. Turbulence. Uh, I'll tell you what, turbulence will make you check your walk with God real quick. It really will. Turbulence will make you say, all right, Lord, am I right with you? Or, or is there something that I need to get right with you? And uh, come on now, if you've ever experienced turbulence, you know what I'm talking about. You get that gut feeling like you're kind of on a roller coaster. You're, you're a bunch of liars. Yeah, yeah, you're you're on the you're on you're thirty thousand feet in the air. Then all of a sudden, the plane just kind of drops a little bit, and you get that little stomach feeling. Uh, you're a little worried, just a little bit. 
Yeah, you're worried just a little bit. And, and so I remember we're, we're on this flight, and there was some turbulence. I mean, it wasn't the roughest turbulence, but it certainly made your stomach a little queasy just a little bit. And so the plane would just kind of sink just a little bit, and people would just kind of just rock in their chair, and people would be a little nervous. And I, and I remember the person sitting next to me, she was with, she's with the crowd who hates flying. And so as the plane kind of sunk a little bit in turbulence, uh, I just remember that she grabbed her friend's wrist. I, I mean, I'm talking like white knuckle. Uh, I, I mean, she, uh, I, I just kind of glance over there a little bit, and it's like she's doing one of these numbers. <sighs> like, uh, like, I didn't know if she was going to have a baby there or, or what. So. Uh, I mean, she, she was breathing heavy. She, had her, she was grabbing her friend's wrist. And I remember her friend just kind of patting her on the hand and saying, hey, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. And she's afraid for her life. She thinks she's not going to make it. And just kind of where I was sitting there in the aisle, I, I would just kind of be able to just kind of peek over and just kind of look down the aisle a little bit. And I don't know, maybe five or six, seven rows up ahead. This is what I see. I just see a little girl sleeping on her daddy's shoulder. Little girl just fast asleep. And uh, here's the thing. Same situation going through. Same destination headed towards. Same turbulence experiencing. One is afraid for her life, and the other is fast asleep on her daddy's shoulder. Well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is this, an absence of fear. There's the difference. There's an absence of fear. Well, why the absence of fear? Well, because of this. So that little one, the only thing that mattered was who she was with. That's all that mattered. Who she was with. All, the only thing that mattered to her was this. As long as I am on daddy's shoulder, nothing wrong is going to happen. Nothing bad is going to happen. You know, um, as we look at our passage, of, this is a very familiar pa passage, a very familiar text, no doubt. Uh, the disciples, they were about to find themselves in a scenario as they were headed to a destination. Uh, we're, we're, what we're going to see here is that on a certain day, on a certain day, Jesus just determined to set sail across the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. Now we're going to read the passage, and, and this passage is going to refer to as the Sea of Galilee as a lake. And to be quite honest with you, that's really what the Sea of Galilee actually is. It's actually a very large lake, and it actually sits below sea level, about six or 700 feet below sea level. And so uh, what we're going to see is that the, Jesus, on a certain day, determines to sail across the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. Look at verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went on into a ship with his disciples and said to them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. So on this, now I'm emphasizing certain day because the Bible talks about a certain day. And on this particular certain day, the disciples became aware that the Lord Jesus had a purpose for them to go from one side of the Sea of Galilee over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they became aware of his purpose. And so here's simply what they did. They knew his purpose, so they submitted to his purpose. They got in the boat. They obeyed his purpose. They got in the boat. They followed him. They followed his instruction. And they obeyed. And, and they were willing to launch out from one side of the Sea of Galilee over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So let me kind of apply this in a, in a certain way, church. Has there ever been a certain day, now look here, that the Lord spoke to you and made his purpose known for you. Has there ever been a certain day that the Lord spoke to you about a purpose that he has for your life? Let me, let me inform you of something that you may already know or may have forgotten. Look here. Regardless of what stage of life you're in, the Lord has a purpose for your life. The Lord has a destination for your life. The, the, the Lord has... Uh, uh, something planned for your life, and here's what he's just desiring for you to do, to submit to get in the boat. He's just desiring for you to submit and to obey and to get in the boat and to set sail to the destination that he has for you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, now church family, 
let, please, please know this, that the, the plan that the Lord Jesus has for your life is a greater plan that you can come up with for yourself. The purpose that he has for your life is a far greater purpose than what you can come up with for your own life. Now listen, as a, as a believer, the greatest decision that you can make after your salvation is this. Surrender to God. That, that really is it. The greatest decision that you can ever make after your salvation, your salvation being the most important decision for your eternity, but after your salvation, the most important decision would be this. Now look up here. Look here, look here, look here. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. Go where he wants you to go. Do what he wants you to do. Surrender to whatever he wants you to surrender to and just get in the boat. And there, there might be questions in your mind that say, well, why should I get in the boat? Why should I surrender to the Lord Jesus? Why should I obey what he has to say? Why should I do all those things? I, I mean, come on now. Listen, if I get in the boat, if I surrender to the Lord, then don't you understand, Pastor, that I, I'm like limiting myself? I'm limiting my future? Don't you understand that I'm limiting my life? And really what I just want to do is I just want to keep my options open so that I can do basically whatever it is that I want to do. So why in the world would I get in the boat? Well, that's a pretty good question, but let me answer it with a really good answer. You should get in the boat because who else is in the boat with you? I thought that was a really good answer. You should get in the boat because he's there with you. Uh -oh, um, Jesus and his disciples, they launched out to sail across the sea. And then as they launched out, the circumstances... Uh, changed on the sea they took a drastic turn in the eyes of the disciples now look at verse number 23 what we're going to see is this the bible says but as they sailed he fell asleep <laughs> now if you, if you don't consider the ministry of the lord jesus you you might think something like this you might think something like well that's kind of a strange time to fall asleep it's kind of a weird place to take a nap now i've never been fishing on a boat but I've heard of plenty of people who passed out on the boat fishing. <laughs> uh, but as you're sailing across the sea, though, so some people might say, well, that's kind of a strange time to, to rest. It's kind of a strange time to take a nap. And okay, I'll, I'll give you that. It might be a little strange. It might be a little odd. But we also need to consider the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Because several weeks ago, we've talked about it. We touched on it. Listen, church, we've got to remind ourselves of this. The ministry of the Lord Jesus was constantly on the move. He was constantly on the go. He was constantly uh, surrounded by multitudes. He was constantly preaching and teaching about the kingdom of heaven. He was constantly healing people. He was constantly on the move. Yes, there was times where he would get away in, in solitude, but even the times in solitude, he wasn't resting. In the times of solitude, he was spending time with his father. And, and so there's plenty of times where Jesus is constantly moving, constantly going. And listen, I'll tell you one thing. I'm pretty sure the vast majority of us, myself included, we couldn't keep up with his ministry. We couldn't keep up with how much he was on the go. We couldn't keep up with how much he was on the move. I mean, come on now. Uh, uh, Jesus, he would tell his disciples to uh, feed uh, uh, thousands of people and, and to serve them. And then after that, then they would continue on in their travels. That's a lot of work. That's a, that's a lot of effort. And so now, finally, finally, there's a little moment of, of a break in the ministry of Jesus as they're setting sail across the Sea of Galilee. And here's what Jesus does. He grabs a pillow and he rests his head. He goes to sleep. Church, we got to remind ourselves of this. He's 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And he got tired like you and I get tired. And he grow weary like you and I grow weary. Now, I understand he's God, but he's also man. And here's the only opportunity for him to find a time of rest. And then as he's resting, look, look at verse number 23 again. He says, but as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake. A storm of wind. Um, church, we got to consider a little bit about the geographical location about the Sea of Galilee. And I've already touched on it just a little bit. 
the Sea of Galilee is actually a very large lake. And it actually sits below sea level, 600, 700 feet below sea level. And of course, in that part of the world, that region of the world, it would certainly get pretty hot. The, 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 the days would be hot. They, they would be, uh, I would say, drudgery, I, I would say, as the, sun would, as the sun in the heat of the day would, would basically be very, very hot during that time of year. And so as the sun would shine down upon the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee was surrounded by mountainous terrain. And so it sits below sea level. The sun is shining. It is, it is extremely hot. But oftentimes what could happen is that the cool winds from those mountainous terrains, they can come and blow into that little valley there. And so, listen, I'm no meteorologist, but I have learned this. When you get warm air and you get cold air and they begin to mix together, you got a recipe for inclement weather. Uh, uh, come on now. Uh, when we get cold air, uh, the winds blowing from the Rockies, and we have the heat from the day, we can get some inclement weather around these parts. More, I mean, more so about the Oklahoma area, of course, Tornado, tornado Alley there. Uh, uh, all that's because of the heat of the sun and the, the coolness of the air. They kind of mix together, and then all of a sudden you got inclement weather. And so basically that's... That's the, the formula of what's taking place there on the Sea of Galilee. You have the heat of the sun. You have the wind, the cool winds from the mountainous terrain. They blow up under, under the sea. And then before you know it, you got a storm on your hands. Now, here's the thing about being in a storm. You can at least take shelter when you're on dry land. When you're on the sea, there's no basement. When you're on the sea, it's not like you could just abandon ship. When you're on the sea, uh, no, 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 no. Listen, church, these are experienced fishermen. They know the ways of the water. They know their way around the boat. They know a way on, on, on how to manage. They, they know their way around that. But here's the thing, what the Bible says. The Bible says that they were filled with water and that, that they were in jeopardy and that they thought they were going to die. This is serious stuff here. Verse number 23, the last part of verse number 23 says, And they were filled with water. And were in jeopardy, and, and they came to him, awoke him, saying, Master, we perish. You know, I think I'd be a little worried if I saw more water coming in the boat than going out of the boat. Wouldn't you? I, 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 I'm not a fisherman. Uh, very rarely have I ever been on very many boats. But I, I, this is one thing that I know. Water's supposed to stay on the outside. Pretty simple guy. Water stays on the outside not on the inside, and you hear the, here are these experienced fishermen, and they're noticing water coming into the boat, and, they're, they're, and they find themselves in jeopardy, and these disciples, they go to their master, and they say to him, Master, we perish. Master, Master, we perish. Okay, now here's the thing, church. These disciples, they were willing to obey the Lord to get in the boat, right? They are willing to submit to the Lord, follow his instruction, and to launch out and to set sail to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But here's what happens. When the circumstances on the sea changed, they were quick to believe they weren't going to make it. They were quick to believe thinking, we're going to die. Now, 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 church, listen. Please, please understand this. Let me have your attention here. We shouldn't think that surrendering our lives to the Lord is surrendering to a life without storms. Don't, don't, don't think that. Don't think that, hey, just because I've surrendered my life to the Lord, just because I surrendered to follow Jesus, just because I've surrendered to obey his will for my life, just because I surrendered that, don't think for a solitary second, church family. Now, please wake up. I know you're tired, but please wake up here. Don't think for a solitary second that just because you surrender to Jesus and do what he wants you to do in your life, that that means you're exempt from the trials of life. That that means that you're exempt from the storms of life. That, that means you're exempt from the hardships of life. Now, listen, I want to be very, very clear here. Actually, when you submit to the Lord Jesus, you should expect more hardships rather than less. We should expect adversity. We should expect there to be resistance. 
We should expect resistance from the world. We should expect resistance from peers. We should expect resistance from relatives. Listen, these disciples, they were convinced because of the Lord's silence that he didn't care. I mean, imagine, these are experienced fishermen, water's coming into the boat, they're in the midst of this storm, and they look over at the bow of the boat, and then there is Jesus, and he's got maybe a blanket over his head, a garment over his head, he's just resting on a pillow, and he's just fast asleep, and they go to Jesus, now I'm just imagining, maybe they're, they're shaking him physically, Master, Master, we perish! The Gospel of Mark, chapter number 4, verse number 38 says this, and they wake him and say unto him, Master, Master, carest not thou, carest thou not that we perish? Lord, don't you care that we are going to die? Lord, don't you care? No, can you imagine just kind of waking him up? You're just kind of shaking him? Don't you care? How can you sleep during this? I think that's a question we're all wondering. How can you sleep during this? He must have been extremely tired. How can you sleep during this? Don't you care? Uh, oh, okay, church, listen. Uh, I'm afraid that people, when they surrender to follow the Lord, and they surrender to serve Jesus, and they surrender to obey him and to follow his will for their lives, when a storm comes, I'm afraid many believers get bitter at God. They get bitter at God. And they figuratively, they shake their fist at God and they say, whoa, 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 whoa. This storm came because I obeyed you. This trial came because I'm following you. This hardship came because I'm doing what you instructed me to do here, Lord. And Lord, I'm trying to cry out to you. I'm trying to follow you. And I'm praying, but it seems like nobody's home. Your word says, knock and it shall be open. Well, I'm banging on the door and no one's answering. Where are you? Therefore, therefore, since you're silent, you must not be home. Therefore, since you're quiet, God, in the midst of my storm, in the midst of my hardship, you don't care. Okay, now church family, please, please grab this truth. Don't mistake his silence for his absence. Just because he's silent doesn't mean he's absent, church. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Just because he's silent doesn't mean he's absent, ladies and gentlemen. Look at verse number 24, second part there. It says, then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging, and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He gets up. The Lord wakes up. And he rebuked the sea. I like, in, I like the way how... The Gospel of Mark describes it. Mark chapter 4, verse number 39. The Bible tells us that when he rebuked the sea and, and the wind, he said this, peace be still. Peace be still. Uh, now, we, we might have a hard time understanding, well, how necessarily is that like a rebuke? Like, peace be still. Well, I have kids. And sometimes they need rebuking. Do you have kids? Sometimes do they need rebuking? No, Billy's an angel. Billy's a little devil. No, <laughs> no, no, no. There's times where, come on, yeah, you, you probably have experienced this, or you probably have seen somebody do this. You might be having a conversation with a fellow adult or a fellow church member, and then all of a sudden there's, there's kids that are kind of around you, and they're just kind of being loud. They're not being disobedient, but they're just being loud. And they're just kind of playing, and they're being rambunctious, and they're kind of maybe even screaming and running around a little bit. And, and listen, they're not, they're not being destructive. They're, they're not being ugly. They're not uh, being uh, 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 disobedient in any way, shape, or form. But you're having a hard time having a conversation with the person in front of you. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, okay. So here's typically a mom or a dad thing to do. Look at Junior and say, shh. Now, if Junior's smart, Junior knows to do this. <gasps> right? <laughs> if your parents did that, did you know to do that? <laughs> shh. Just a simple shh. That should be enough. Honestly, parents, that should be enough. Shh. And they should know right away. Okay. 
Mom's serious. Or Dad's serious. I'm going to go play somewhere else. Now, now, the words be still, listen, the Greek words for be still, it means literally this, to make silent. It means to, like, to, to muzzle. So you have a bunch of kids playing, and all of a sudden mom or dad says, shh, okay, I want to be quiet. Hey, you know what Jesus did to, those, to the winds and the waves when he said, peace be still? Now, now listen, he said this, shh. That's what happened. Peace be still. It's like he's saying to the winds and the waves, put a muzzle on it. <laughs> he's saying to the winds and the waves, hey, hush up. Be quiet. And the moment, listen, the moment he said, peace be still, listen, the Bible says that there was a calm. And listen, when he says, peace be still, listen, I truly believe this, not one more wave crashed into that boat. Not one more gust of wind blew through their hair. Not, listen, when he said, peace be still, listen, I imagine this, that that Sea of Galilee was just like glass. Calm, quiet. Why is that? Because the Lord spoke and he has authority, that's why. And he said, peace be still. And all of a sudden, there was a calm there. There was a silence there. And then the, the disciples, they're in just utter amazement. And they're saying, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves, they obey him. <laughs> That's our God. That's our God, church. So Jesus, he rebukes the winds and the waves. says, peace be still. says, Shh. And then after he does doing that, here's what Jesus does next. He rebukes his disciples. Look at verse 25. Look there. See for yourself. And he said unto them, where is your faith? Okay, now church, look here. When Jesus says, where is your faith, he's not saying that they had a little bit of faith. No, according to Jesus, a whole lot of faith can move a mountain. Just a little bit of faith. But Jesus said, where is your faith? That implies this. They had no faith. They had no faith at all whatsoever. Because in Mark's account, uh, Mark put it this way, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Okay, church, listen. When faith is absent in the midst of a storm, when faith is absent in the midst of a storm, fear will always be present. Did you catch that? When faith is absent, fear will show its ugly face. But you know how to combat fear? Faith. Because faith will always conquer fear. Yeah. Listen, these disciples, they were fearful that they were going to perish in the storm because they simply had no faith. The uh, second part of verse 20, 25 talked about how uh, that they were, uh, well, let me just read it again. I already said it. It says, and they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. You see in the verse there where it says that they wondered. They wondered. You know what the word wondered means? To be struck with amazement. To be, to be utterly astonished. That's what the word wondered means. Okay, now, come on. Put yourself in their situations. Put yourself in the boat. You wake up Jesus. You're the one who's waking him up saying, don't you care? Don't you care? We're going to die here. And then all of a sudden he gets up and he says, peace be still. Then all of a sudden, shoo, just all of a sudden, quiet, stillness, not one more breeze, not one more wave, just utter silence there. I think we're all doing one of these numbers. Come on, I know you've known the story ever since you were a child, but come on, don't lose the reality of it. Come on, you would be an utterly, utterly shocked stage. You would be in utter amazement there. And listen, that's exactly what the disciples were. They were in utter amazement. They were astonished. But, but here's the thing. They shouldn't have been. They shouldn't have been. Well, why is that? Because throughout the journey, as difficult as it may have been to, for, for that storm to have gone through, as difficult as it may have been, listen to this, church, Jesus was always in their midst. He was always present. Now listen to this. His presence is the greatest comfort that they could have ever had. In the midst of that storm, 
regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how big the waves were, regardless of how much water was coming into the boat, here's what they just simply needed to realize. Look over there. Look who's in the boat. Since he is present, that's our comfort. Since he is present, we're going to be fine. Since he is present, here's what we can have. We can have faith that we're going to make it through to the other side because he said so. Listen, as they obeyed, they should have had faith that his presence was all the assurance that they needed that they were going to make it through this storm. And listen, church, it would be their faith that would have conquered their fear. Oh, right, now, church, now give attention here. As you make the decision to obediently follow the Lord, it's going to be your faith that will conquer your fears as you face storms in life. Did you hear that? Did you catch that? When you decide to obediently follow the Lord, okay, now I'm going to stop right there for a little bit. I mean this, you obediently follow the Lord. I'm not just saying that you claim to follow Jesus. I'm not saying you have a claim to be a, a spiritual giant. No, no, I'm saying this, that your life it is in obedience to the scriptures. Your life is in obedience to the word. Your life is in obedience to what God commands through, through his preserved word for us. Listen, the word is very, very real in your life. And when you decide to live in obedience to the scriptures and in accordance to his word and in accordance to his way, listen, it's going to be your faith that will conquer your fears when storms come in your life. I'm not saying if storms come in your life. Look here, I'm saying when storms come in your life. Because storms will always come, church family. Obediently following the Lord, church, is the, is, I've already said this before, it's the best way to live your life. It really is. To obediently follow the Lord, surrendering your life to Him is the greatest thing that you can do in this life after your salvation. Well, why is that? Well, well for a couple of things. First of all, you get to have a close relationship with God. And that should be enough. That should be enough. Yeah, when, when you decide to obediently follow the Lord, well, let me put it this way. When you decide to get in the boat, when you decide to surrender to what he wants you to surrender to, here's the thing. You get to be used by God. You get to see God work wonders. You get to see God work miracles even. You get to see God provide over and over and over and over again. Hey, hey listen, let me just kind of put it this way. Living the Christian life, the obedient Christian life is awesome. I, I'm not trying to uh, use the word awesome flippantly. I'm not trying to do that. This pizza is awesome. No. <laughs> no, I, by when I say awesome, I mean by the actual definition of the word awesome. It leaves a person in awe. When you live the obedient Christian life, there will be time and time and time and time again where you're just in awe of how good and how great God is in your life. You'll be in absolute awe about how God has provided for you in your life. You'll be in absolute awe about how God has provided for your family and time and time and time again about how he's taking care of you. You will be in absolute awe. Living the, Christian, the obedient Christian life is an awesome life to live, church family. But here's the thing. That doesn't mean that you're exempt from storms. That doesn't mean that problems aren't coming. That doesn't mean that storms are not on the horizon. Listen, we all face storms. Listen, some storms come as a result of our own doing, right? Some storms come because of a result of our sinful choices. Listen, I'm not talking about those decisions. I'm not talking about those storms. The storms I'm talking about is this. You have decided to follow Jesus. You have decided to obey his word. You have decided to obey his will. He has made a purpose known for your life, and you've decided to follow after that purpose in complete and utter surrender. And here's the thing, church. There will be storms that come in your life as a result of following Jesus. Listen, a storm may come that could affect your relationships because you've decided to follow Jesus. Okay. Um, consider this situation. Now, I, 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 just, I hypothetically made up a situation, but I just want to get your opinion on this. Just use your imagination. A young couple gets married. And then as they're in, enjoying the newly, newlywed stage, a, the young lady, the, 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 the young wife, 
for whatever reason, for whatever cause or for whatever situation, she decides to get, or she accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. Glory to God. She gets saved. And as she gets saved, she is faithful to church. And as she gets saved, she is surrounding herself with God's people. And as she gets saved, she is finding spiritual nourishment through the word and she's spending time in the word and she's spending time in prayer and she's seeking to be a blessing to others and she's seeking to 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 serve in certain ways she's being others minded and not selfishly minded then as what is transpiring is that she is beginning to realize listen i want to surrender and i want to do more for the lord jesus and then all of a sudden the lord speaks to her heart about her finances and the lord speaks to her heart about giving and the Lord speaks to her heart about tithing. God's people should tithe. That's all I'm going to say about that. God's people should tithe. But here's the thing. The Lord speaks to her heart about tithing. And so here's what she does. She goes to her unbelieving husband and says to her unbelieving husband, and let's just say that he's the breadwinner of the home. Let's just say that he's the one who's putting in the, the, the overtime to try to put food on the table and pay for the bills and to pay off the mortgage and to pay for the car payment. She goes to her husband and says, sweetheart, I've decided to follow Jesus and I've decided to be surrendered to him. And that God has been speaking to my heart about my finances, about our finances. I think we should give 10% away of our income to somebody who's lost. To somebody who's not saved. To somebody who doesn't believe in the things of God. Now let me just ask you, church. How many of you think that's a recipe for a storm to take place in the marriage? That's a recipe for a storm to take place. That's a, that's a formula right there. That's some hot air and that's some cold air mixing together for, for a storm to take place right there in that relationship there. Absolutely. Hey, listen. Following the Lord Jesus can even put, bring storms in your marriage. It's possible. Listen, that's why it's so important you marry the right one. Well, come on. It's important you marry the right one. God cares about who you marry. God cares about who you don't marry also. It's important that you marry the right one. But, but the point I'm trying to make is this. Storms can be a brewing because someone decided to follow Jesus. Listen, storms can begin to take place because someone might decide, no, I'm going to follow the Lord in everything that I say and everything that I do. But I have these peers and I have these co-workers. And listen, they're constantly trying to invite me to go to the bar with them. And they're constantly trying to invite me to partake in things that, that Christians and that God's people shouldn't partake in. They want me to act like they act and to walk like they walk and to talk like they talk. And they want me to partake in all, all of these ungodly things. And, and listen, I, I, I care about them and I love them, but I can't do what they do. Hey, listen, it's possible. I'm just saying it's possible that storms can brew in those relationships. You think you're better than us because you're not doing what we do? You, you think you're better than we are? Come on, church. This, 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 these things happen. You think you're better than we are? Listen, storms can happen in relationships. Storms can happen at work. Storms can happen in your health. What do you mean my health? Do I need to remind us about Job? One day there was a man named Job. And he was following God. And it cost him his health. Come on. It, it could even cost us our health. Listen, there, there are so many storms that can come as a result of following Jesus. But, but here's the thing, church. Uh, let me encourage you. Don't fear those storms. Don't fear those storms that would come as a result of you taking a stand to follow the Lord, to taking a stand to obey his will, to taking a stand to obey and to accomplish his purposes that he spoke to you about on a certain day. D don't be afraid of those storms. Well, Pastor Richard, that's easy for you to say. You're standing behind the pulpit. Why, why shouldn't I be afraid? Listen, don't you realize I can lose relationships? Don't you realize I can use, uh, lose relationships with loved ones and with family members? Don't you realize I can lose my job? Don't you realize I can be looked down upon at the workplace? Don't you realize that I can be the outcast? Don't you realize why shouldn't I be afraid? You shouldn't be afraid because of this truth. He's in the boat with you. He's in the boat with you. And listen, he's the one who can say, shh. And that storm can go away like that. Now listen, I'm not saying that God always just shh and your problems just go away like that. Because truthfully, that he don't do that. Your problems just don't magically just go away. 
I don't, not magically, miraculously go away. They just don't miraculously go away. But here's the thing. I might lose relationships. Let me remind you of this. Look here. The one who's in the boat with you, <laughs> he's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Well, I might lose my job if I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus. Don't you realize I can lose my job? Well, listen, the one who's in the boat with you, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he can provide for you. He provides for the birds, doesn't he? And aren't you more valuable than the birds? Absolutely. Pastor Richard, I can lose so much. Don't you understand? Yes, I do understand. But here's the thing. When you realize who's in the boat with you, and you might be crying out, and he might not be saying a whole lot, but you know that these storms are a result of you taking a stand and following the Lord. You know that these storms are not a result of sinful choices, not a result of bad judgment, but these are just simply a, the decision is based on I'm going to follow the Lord with my life regardless of what comes my way, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to continue to serve. I'm going to continue to give. I'm going to continue, I'm going to, continue to be a blessing to others regardless of whatever storms come my way. Because listen, he might be silent, but I know he's not absent. He's there. Church family, don't be scared of the storms that come your way when you decide, I'm going to decide to follow Jesus. Don't be afraid of the storms that come your way when you've decided to take a stand. I'm going to accomplish his purposes in my life. Don't be afraid of those storms. Why? Because he's with you the entire time. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And we serve a God who does not lie. We serve a God who does not fail. We serve a God who's able to say, peace be still, and the storms are calm. That's our God. So Calvary Baptist Church, first of all, here's what we need to do. There might be some of us in here who are still hesitant to get in the boat in the first place. There might be some people in here this morning that God has been speaking to your heart about something. A certain day, he's trying to make his purposes known unto you. And you've been fighting, and you've been resisting, and you've been really hesitant to get in the boat and truly surrender. And to truly commit. And to truly say, Lord, I am yours. Whatever it is you want me to do, that's what I'll do. Wherever it is you want me to go, that's where I'll go. Whoever it is you want me to witness to, that's who I'll witness to. Hey, listen, some of us are still hesitant to get in that boat. But listen, when you get in the boat, I'm not saying storms go away. Expect storms. But your greatest comfort is this. He's with you the entire time. He's with you all the way. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He might be silent. But know this, he is with you in the midst of your storm. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this, this morning you've given us. Father, there may be some folks here this morning that can also say that perhaps maybe their, their walk with you might be at a standstill and and maybe on a, at a certain day, you've revealed a purpose for them. You've revealed a plan for them. And, and Lord, maybe, they, maybe at one point they did get in the boat. And maybe at one point, Lord, they did surrender. And they, they were involved. And they, they did uh, desire to, to, to please you. But then all of a sudden, something happened. And all of a sudden, a, a storm came. And relationships were being affected. Or maybe income was being affected, or, or just the circumstances of life, Lord, had, had changed. And now, dear God, maybe there might be some people in here who are just bitter. And they're not willing to take another step. Not willing to move forward. Not willing to budge and just say, I'm fine. I'm fine. God knows where I'm at. I'm fine. Oh, dear God, help us. Help us, Lord, that that's not the case. Help us, Lord, to always have a surrendered heart, a surrendered spirit. And, Lord, yes, we will go through storms. And, yes, Lord, it could be at the expense of relationships. It could be at the expense of an employment. It could be at the expense of turning our worlds upside down. But, Lord, if we can truthfully and honestly with a clear conscience say, these the storms came as a result of just simply my obedience to you. 
These, these storms came simply as a, as a result of my surrender to you. Th these storms came simply as, out of a love for you. Lord, if that's the case, and if we can honestly and truthfully declare such a thing, then Lord, help us to remind ourselves that you're with us. You're with us in our storms. And dear God, I pray. And hopefully, Lord, that this would just be a reminder. Lord, I don't know of any particular storms. Dear God, I pray that you'd always help us to remind ourselves that you're with us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being so good to us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand, church family. Are you completely surrendered? Are you in the boat? Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you, I'll say what you want me to say. Lord, I am yours. Complete and absolute utter surrender. It's the best life you can live.